Competitive advantage. What does it mean? To compete means you've got two forces, at least, that are trying, fighting, for access to the same scarce resource. Okay. So, competitive advantage means that one entity, one individual, one animal, one organization, has something that it can have an advantage over the other one to knock that out and access the scarce resource. So we have this competitive advantage. So that something makes it superior in some way. Okay, so larger fish may be stronger and able to eat more food. Well, on the alternative, smaller fish may be able to get into smaller openings and get access to food where the large fish can't. So each has a competitive advantage within a certain context over the other. Similarly, organizations have competitive advantages. Okay. Competitive advantages allow organizations to survive in a highly competitive industry. Okay. You look at the headlines every day, new companies emerge and old companies die. Okay. Why? Well, from an, an evolutionary and biological perspective, some organizations are just more fit for a certain competitive landscape. Given the environment, the, the atmosphere, the weather, the climate, the type of food that's available, certain organisms survive better. Similarly, given an industry structure, certain organizations succeed more than others. And each industry has different structures. So the competitive forces, the things that determine whether organizations succeed or fail in, say, the airline industry may be different, and quite likely are different, than, say, the higher education industry. Okay. So when we talk about industry structure, frequently our textbooks move and take the perspective of a man named Michael Porter. He's a Harvard Business School professor, and he's one of the leading thinkers on competition. And he proposed a model of industry structure. Now, it's not the only model of looking at competition and industry structure and the competitive environment of a business, but it's probably the most popular. It's being taught at business schools around the world. Okay. In Porter's model of industry structure, we have five basic forces, five forces that affect how an organization is going to compete, that shape an organization's competitive strategy, much like the climate and the different types of food that are available, the different types of shelter, the environment for reproductive security, all shape the competitive forces of different animals living in a certain ecosystem. The competitive environment that businesses operate in has these five forces. And what are they? There's rivalry among competitors, but there's also what's called the bargaining power of suppliers, the bargaining power of customers. There are the threat of substitutions and the threat of new entrants. Let's talk about bargaining power first. It's pretty straightforward to think you have a business and you buy products from your suppliers and you do something with those inputs and then you sell something to your customers. Okay. So if you look at your suppliers, you have to ask yourself, what happens if I don't like what they're doing? What happens if I don't like their price? or the quality of their product is not very good, or at least doesn't meet my needs as a business. Maybe I'm taking their inputs and I have to do a lot of work to change this raw material into my finished good. What do I do? Well, if there's only one company providing your product that you need, you're kind of stuck. If there's only two companies you need, you're still kind of stuck. It's like if your business on the North Shore of Oahu needs internet access, there's only a handful of options you've got. Okay. You go out to rural Western Virginia, you may only have one. So your bargaining power with that supplier, you say, look, I need a lower price. And they're gonna say, this is the price we've got. And you're gonna say, tough beans, I guess I have to take it. Okay. What's your option? You don't have one, you can neither go without or put up with their terms. They hold the higher bargaining power because they're the only, as we say in English, the only game in town. 
are the only ones that we can go to for this. Okay, Even if there's just a handful, oftentimes it's not enough to really get them competing against each other. Okay, Now, so you have competitive bargaining power of suppliers. Now, if there's a lot of suppliers, then you have lots of options. Okay, If you have few suppliers, you have few options. If you are tied in somehow to your your supplier, which we'll talk about in a minute, then you have fewer options. Okay, If you only rely somewhat on them, they don't provide a service, you may be purchasing envelopes for your business. Okay, Or you may be buying flour for your restaurant. And one brand of flour may be comparable to another. Then we call that a commodity. There's not much to distinguish that product from that supplier from another product from another supplier. So that influences this relationship you have with your supplier. Okay. Turning to the other side of your process, to the customers, what influences your interaction? Now you're the supplier and they're the customer. If you're the only game in town, you can kind of say to your customer, look, this is our price, we offer it. When Henry Ford started manufacturing automobiles in, in the United States, they were available, as he put it, in any color you want as long as it's black. Okay. If you wanted a different color car, you had to paint it yourself. Now, we've got a multitude of colors available and people can have whatever they want because there's a lot of different players in this space now. There's lots of competition in the automobile industry. Okay. So, what do you do? You increase variety, you compete on those things. So, But when you're the only one, then they don't have a choice. It's either because you're maybe the only one available in this area, you're the only one who has the patent for this particular product, or because they have some loyalty with you. Okay? If you're Apple Computer and you have businesses that have invested in software uh, written for the Mac OS X platform, it's going to be harder for them to switch because then they have to rebuy all of their software. Okay? So you have higher bargaining power at this point. Okay, they're locked in. Okay, so those are your kind of your two basic common sense relationships: your bargaining power of your suppliers and your bargaining power of your customers. What you don't want to be in a position of is you've got a limited number of suppliers and customers with lots of options. One example of this: airline industry. Okay, you go out and you're looking for a flight back home. It's Christmas break or it's summer or whatever. You're trying to get home and you go online now. You look and you say, I want the cheapest fare, or I want the shortest flight, or I want various things. And there's a lot of different options generally, depending on where you live. And you have power to claim take this one's the lowest price at the options that I want. Now, if you're the airline industry, though, you've got all these customers saying, gimme, 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 on my terms. And if you don't, then I'm going to go to another airline that will. And you turn to your suppliers. And you need air airplanes. How many suppliers of airplanes are there? Passenger planes. Two, pretty much. It's Boeing and Airbus. You're stuck. If you don't like what these two offer, that's really it. Okay. So you can't really dictate much in the way of your suppliers. And your customers have lots of options. So you're kind of stuck competing on price, maybe a little bit of availability. And you try some things. And there may be some ways of enhancing your service but it's not a good position to be in. So, but we have suppliers and we have customers. The other two forces, the threat of new entrants, okay? Threat of new entrants. What happens is how easy is it for new people to start up in your industry? Okay, what are what we call the barriers to entry? Now, if you're in the auto manufacturing industry, it's a really hard industry to break into. Same thing with if you make the little chips that run inside of computers, semiconductors. Okay, if you're Intel, you're in a good position in terms of the threat of new entrants because it requires billions of dollars in factories, training, knowledge, patents, etc. to get up and running. Okay. So I'm not going to go out today and say, hey, I'm going to start a semiconductor company because it takes a lot of investment. And I'm going to go try to get money from the bank and from investors, and they're going to go, well, how are you going to compete with AMD and Intel or some of these other um, lesser-known processor manufacturers? Okay, It's going to be hard. 
Okay. Same thing. If I'm say I'm going to start my own auto industry, auto company, I'm going to make cars. Okay. That's hard. Now, let's say I want to start selling breadfruit. How hard is it in Oahu to get into the breadfruit selling industry? Not hard at all. I go out to my yard, I pick breadfruit off my tree, I go set up a stand on the side of Cam Highway, and I'm set. Okay, very, very low barrier to entry. I don't have a breadfruit tree, I go find someone who has one, I dig it up, I put it in my yard, and it's good. Okay, so very low barriers to entry there as compared to the billions of dollars it might take um, to start something more complex. Okay, so there's, there's different, different variations but we're looking for threat of new entrants. How concerned do I have to be that someone, I'm going to wake up in the morning and find out somebody has decided to move in to my space. Okay. So that's, that's a barrier to entry, threat of new entrants. Last competitive force that we really want to worry about. The threat of substitutions. Well, that's the fourth, and then fifth is competitive rivalry. Threat of substitutions. What are we talking about here? We've got substitute products. Now substitute products are not the same as products being offered by our customers. Okay? So if I make Colgate toothpaste, my rival might be Crest. Okay? We both make toothpaste. Now I might be able to differentiate. Mine has maybe different sparkles or different swirls or might whiten your teeth or make your breath smell better, but it's fundamentally the same product. Okay? But you think about Substitute products. If someone decides not to buy toothpaste, what could they buy instead that accomplishes, that meets the same need? That's what we're really looking at with substitutes. Okay? Meets the same need. So, for example, we have in travel, you have airplane flights, you have train rides, bus rides, and car trips. Okay? These are four substitute products. They're not the same product. Anyone who's driven across a large piece of land will tell you they've been in a, in a bus for eight hours. It's a different experience than flying for two. Okay. So that's one thing to think about. There's substitute products. What will they do if they don't take mine? Okay. Um, you can think in terms of desktop PCs. In some cases, we may have a substitute product in handheld computing devices. It's not the same product, but it may meet the same need. Okay? Milkshakes and coffee don't sound like they're the same product. They're not, but they're substitute products. Okay? They accomplish the same purpose. Okay? All right, so those are substitutions. So you look around and you say, well, what are the threat of substitutions? If prices go up for wheat, then the demand for corn may start increasing to balance that out. As demand drops for wheat, more people may buy corn. Okay. Threat of substitutions. So, and then we have competitive rivalry, which is how does my product compare with my competitor's product? Okay. Is it better, faster, cheaper, different color, different flavor? Is there some sort of brand association going on with it? Those types of things. So those are your five competitive forces. That's the environment in which your organization, your business, either lives or dies. Okay. So within that environment, you have to look, be aware, and you have to adapt to your environment and figure out, well, how am I going to compete? Okay. You can do that in a couple of ways. You go, well, um, where's my biggest threat? And you can try and figure out, based on that biggest threat, what you can do about it. Okay, That's probably one way of uh, addressing the issue. Or figuring out which threat you really can do something about. Maybe you can't change the relationship you have with your suppliers. But you might be able to do something about your customers. Find ways to, to lock them in or to make your product stand out. You could just lower your prices. That's really, really dangerous, especially if you're a startup business, because then you might get into a price war, and then you're dropping your price, they're dropping their prices, everyone's dropping their prices until somebody's losing money instead of making money. So we can differentiate ourselves on price, and Walmart is held up as an example of being able to successfully differentiate on price, 
though I think their competitive advantage goes a little bit further than that, as I'll discuss in a minute. Okay, but if you can find another way of enhancing your product or enhancing the relationship that all these other forces have with your product, then that can be your competitive advantage. 